does make up about 30 or 40 percent of your exam so it's kind of important um, the main thing really is PEP and mom will probably be multiple choice but with HKS ethics and law you'll need to really be able to understand them and talk about them because we had a nine mark extended response last year on HKS so that's pretty much where they get their marks from in that one so we'll start with HEP. I'll be covering integrative medicine, behavioural change and lifestyle modification, mindfulness, essence, Ornish program and stress and body, stress and mind-body interactions. So integrative medicine is acknowledging that an integrative approach is often the best way to treat a patient and there's a no one size fits all approach. So it's a whole systems approach that looks at physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, social and environmental well-being. Um, some CAMs are safer and more cost effective than conventional treatments. So it's acknowledging this and realizing that it's not always going to be an option to switch to like fear the first line of treatment to be pharm pharmacology. So it's looking at other ways that we can treat diseases and all that sort of thing. Um, so 60 to 65% of Australians use some form of complementary therapies, and that is a statistic that you're going to have to know. Same with 89% use CAMs for serious medical conditions alongside their conventional treatment. But the main thing that you want to remember there is that 72% did not inform their doctor. So these complementary therapies can be chiropractors, su uh, supplements, dietary changes, all that sort of thing. Um, so it's really important with noting how these might interact with the drugs that we give patients and that sort of thing. So that's why they really push that. So complementary therapies are therapies used alongside conventional treatment. They're not alternative. That's alternative medicine. So therapies which are used as an alternative for conventional treatment. So complementary used alongside something like pharmacological treatment 
alternative is like completely throwing pharmacological out the window and using these. So um, they're used in conjunction with the medicines that we give them to try and enhance outcomes, minimise side effects and symptoms, maybe reduce some costs. Um, and then we need to consider all of the options when we're assessing our patients. And we need to make sure that they're informed of all these complementary therapies because maybe they have some cultural views and that sort of thing where they prefer to use these instead of the medicine that we want to give them. So there are some benefits of CAMs. Some are safer and more cost effective. Patients often prefer these natural treatments. There's often a dissatisfaction with conventional treatments as they often have a lot of side effects. Uh, it's a bit more of a holistic approach and patients feel as though they're more educated about their treatment. So if they're getting these complementary therapies, they feel like they're not just being shoved a drug where they don't know what it's doing. They don't really understand how it works. So they often feel a bit more in control and that can be a bit of a placebo effect in itself. So there's different types of PAMs, whole medical systems, biologically based, mind body, energy medicine and manipulative and body based. And it's good just to know a few examples of each of these. Now the stuff that you all love, how good were those hip tubes where you just got to sit there and meditate for two hours? Um, so it's a mental discipline involving training attention. So it's deciding where we want to put our attention. And there's a bunch of assumptions that he will push. People generally operate on autopilot and we are capable of sustained attention, but we just require practice. And you might all be noticing that with your exam prep. Um, awareness makes life richer, replaces unconscious reactiveness and gives accuracy to perceptions. Awareness enhances perception, effective action and control. So basically it just means we're in more control of what we're doing and we're not just sort of going through the motions. So practicing mindfulness involves a change in attitude, attention, and it is developed through formal meditation and informal daily activities and cognitive practices. So you would have all done those meditation things in class where you sit there and so think about this, don't think about this, think about the food that you're eating, all that sort of stuff. And then the daily activities would be when they wanted you to practice, like you're in the shower putting shampoo on your head and you're like, wow, how does this feel on my head? All that sort of stuff. Um, so that's just like being a bit more aware about what you're doing, where your body is, that sort of thing. So there's all these benefits to mindfulness. Peak performance slows ageing, shortens, slow shortening of the telomeres, which I don't know, Craig Hassard frothed that with you guys. <laughs> Telomeres were his shit. <laughs> um, so you can get higher emotional intelligence, reduced re relapse of depression, reduction in mood disturbances and stress caused by cancer. For the patient, it lowers the severity days of illness and days of work. And for the clinician, not being mindful leads to more diagnostic errors. So if you're in a hospital, you're not really thinking about what you're doing you're more prone to making more errors, I suppose. Um, whereas if you're actually thinking about what you're doing, you're less likely to make these errors that can be avoided. So multitasking and default brain. Multitasking, as Craig Hassel would say, is an illusion. And basically you just do this really fast switching between tasks. Um, did he make you do like the one, two, three, A, B, C thing? It was like you try and count one to 26 as fast as you can, and then try and say the alphabet as fast as you can. But then if you go one A, two B, you get a lot slower, and you're actually like, shit, this is a thing. Um, so it involves fast paced switching between tasks, and attention deficit trait is trying to deal with too much at once, and results in difficult staying, difficulty staying organized and constant pain or guilt. So he'll say that most of the time we're in default mode, which is when we're unattentive, distracted, daydreaming, worrying, depressive, or dreaming at night. And it's important to note that areas activated are similar to those affected in Alzheimer's disease, and they're associated with stress, anxiety, depression, ADH, and autism, all of the stuff that we're trying to avoid. So now his favourite, his pride and joy essence, 
So education is not school education. It can be sometimes, but for the most part, we want to know how much they know about their condition. Have they Googled it themselves and diagnosed them with cancer when they have a runny nose? Um, have they had any experiences with this before? Do they know someone else that has this? It's not necessarily about the highest level of education that they receive at school. But in some senses, it can be as in how big of words can I use to describe this condition to the patient? Did they complete year 12 or did they drop out in year seven? So it is useful to know, but it's not really what they're focusing on when they're talking about education. So stress. There's a difference between stress and anxiety. So anxiety is being worried about a future event disproportional to the level of threat that the event poses. And stress is a perceived inability to cope. It is an important survival mechanism, but it can be harmful when it's sustained over a long period of time. So all your exam prep, that sort of thing, it's not really that great for you. So try not to stress, otherwise you're going to increase your allostatic load, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so the main thing to remember is that anxiety is worrying about a future event and stress is saying, I cannot cope with this event. So the effects of stress, I'm sure you've all seen the stress performance curve and then Craig Hassid likes to add that other little one. He's like, no, you can be really stressed and, or you can be not stressed, sorry, and still have a really good performance, but I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so it's said that stress decreases your immune, immune function, prolongs activation of SNS, which is increasing that allostatic load, as I said before. Lethargy, headaches, depression, nausea, increased aggression, decreased concentration, independent risk factor for diseases. So basically just think about yourself before your VCE exams and that's like everything that you're feeling then. So allostatic load is the wear and tear on the body that occurs due to chronic stress. So it's prolonged activation of the SNS. So for a, it's only meant to be sustained for a short period of time. When you get your lectures from Parco about stress and she'll use the saber-toothed tiger analogy about how you're running away from one of those, that's all it's meant for. It's not meant to sustain you for days or weeks. So when you have this sustained stress response, your body doesn't know how to handle it and it's going to lead to immune dysregulation. So it'll lower your immune response. Um, you get increased inflammation. So your whole body will just like freak out. Uh, atherosclerosis, which is obviously an issue for cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, so you might lead to obesity, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, all that stuff, um, bone demineralization, so there's a chance that you'll get osteoporosis, um, and then hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are responsible for learning memory and executive functions. So if there's atrophy of the neurons in there, obviously that's going to go down, so that's a really big thing. And then you'll get enlargement of the amygdala because this is the part that's responsible for the fear and stress response. So people with an increased allostatic load will be seen with a larger amygdala, amygdala and a smaller hippocampus and prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. So signs of burnout, lack of personal achievement, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and who would have guessed burnout? I don't understand it, but it's a thing. So good thing to remember is these two well, these three statistics 28 percent of medical students had burnout by the final year i think that is about like 98 percent in first year that's just my statistic 75 percent of interns had burnout after eight months and 73 percent of interns met the criteria for psychiatric morbidity on at least one occasion which sounds crazy but so benefits of stress management, improved immune function, reduced anxiety, distress and depression, improved sensitivity towards patients, greater use of positive coping skills and less of negative, so like <coughs> talking to friends, talking to family instead of getting drunk on the weekend. <laughs> greater use, uh, sorry, better resolution of personal conflicts, increased empathy and reduced sense of isolation. So like all the bad things that stress does, basically just the opposite. Um, so next, on to spirituality. It's not just about someone's religion, so if they're Catholic or whatever. It's 
how they find meaning in their life and how they deal with stresses. So you might ask someone, are they a spiritual person? And they'll say no. Then you say, what, like, what are your coping strategies? And they might say, oh, I like to go to my local sewing club and I talk to all the ladies there and I just that's how I find my outlet. So that's sort of spirituality or it might be they like to read or something like that. It's just how they cope with things going on in their life. And then another statistic, 83% of patients want doctors to ask about their spiritual beliefs. So as much as you might feel awkward saying, oh, are you a spiritual person? It's something that a lot of people want to talk about, um, especially if there is some cultural differences there because that's something that will need to come into consideration when you're treating your patients. And so religion can have positive or negative consequences. It can be positive if people see it as a way to cope with what they've got. So, as I said, they might go to church, they might do that sort of thing. Um, but then it can be negative if a person sees their illness as a punishment for their sins, which can be the case with some religions. Um, it's been seen that religion is a protective for depression, suicide, substance abuse, physical illness, longevity and mortality rates, rates and it's one of the most important protective factors for adolescent harm which is a bit important to remember. So views on happiness can either be hedonic or eudonic. So hedonic is immediate gratification, pleasure attainment and pain avoidance, whereas eudonic focuses on meaning and personal growth and it leads to lower information and better defences. So basically the eudonic is the one that we really want. Um, hedonic is just like don't care what I have to do, just want like the benefit, whereas eudonic is like, the process, I want to work hard to get there, all that sort of thing. So exercise uh, reduces mortality in everything, delays the onset of diabetes, acts as a buffer to slow the degradation of telomeres. Again, I'm sure you would have pushed that. Um, males are generally more active than females and exercise levels decline drastically once we get over 18 years old, which you probably all noticed since starting uni. Um, so you're most likely to be active in inactive if you're a woman, have a language other than English, low education and social economic status and have children under five. Like you can imagine trying to handle them would be enough exercise on its own. And 70% of Australians over 15 are classified as sedentary. So that's really important when it comes to like thinking about risk factors and all that sort of thing for other comorbidities. So I'll leave that there. I don't need to read that out. It's basically a risk factor for absolutely everything. And then these are the disease prevention recommendations. So basically what you have to remember, aerobic helps everything and then cancer and dementia only improve with aerobic exercise so they don't use resistance or balance or that sort of thing. And basically just use common sense. Like if you've got osteoporosis, you're going to want to, strengthen your bones so you're going to be using resistance and balance whereas if you've got someone with dementia you're not really going to be wanting them to do balance activities because they don't even know where they are let alone something else so they're the exercise guidelines you should know if you did year 12 PE you'd already be set in that shout out PE um Barriers to exercise, lack of time, lack of motivation, lack of money, physical injuries and conditions and convenience. So that goes along with why mums are less active because it's not convenient for them. They're too busy looking after their kids that they don't have time to be doing it themselves. Um, so guidelines for nutrition, whole fresh food, predominantly plant-based, a varied diet, well-prepared, few empty calories, which is like processed food and that sort of thing. 1 to 0.5 to 2 litres of water per day and a total fat intake of less than 30% of the total calories. Um, for cancer, increased soy intake has reduced the risk of death and reoccurrence of breast cancer. Increased vitamin D levels has reduced fatality rates for breast cancer. You'll learn all about this in second year. It's like all the different hormones interacting, you don't need to know that, just know that it's good for reducing rates of breast cancer. And high fruit and veg in intake can be a preventative for cancer. So these sort of vegetables are like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, probably everything that you hated as a kid and your mum told you to eat. 
Um, the recommendations for cancer are be as lean as possible without being underweight, be active for at least 30 minutes per day, uh, calorie restriction, but that doesn't mean like reducing your calories. It just means the same as over here where it was um, reducing calorie <coughs> empty food, so junk food, processed food, that sort of thing. Eat a variety of fruit, vegetables, grains and pulses, limit red meats and salty foods and don't use supplements. Was anyone else really depressed when he told you that peanut butter caused cancer? <laughs> that like wrecked half the people in our cohort. <laughs> Um, so longer telomeres are associated with vitamin D, C and E, folate and omega-3, shorter telomeres, smoking, processed meat, red meat with no starch. And he would put peanut butter up there, but I wasn't prepared to do it. Uh, so connectedness, isolation has health consequences, whereas solitude is not necessarily a predictor of poor health. Solitude sort of just like I'm alone, but I'm okay with that. Isolation is like I'm alone, I have no one, I feel so out of it, um, I'm excluded. Um, and so independent of other lifestyle factors, social isolation is associated with doubling of death rates. So when people feel like they're alone and they have no one to talk to or they have no one to support them, it's been shown to have a really big impact on how people or how people's diseases progress and what their mortality rates are going to be like. So connectedness can come from a whole range of things and protective factors for diseases are marriages, unless they're obviously unhappy, where it's going to be a risk factor, uh, contact with family, religious affiliation, like we said before, and then being a member of a group. So the environment has three components, physical environment, which is like air, water, sound, climate, chemicals in the air, that sort of thing. Uh, human made, so that could be like town planning, architecture, um, all that sort of thing. And then non physical is your social, your cultural, your intellectual. So the direct impacts come from air quality, chemical exposure, soil quality, and climate. And your indirect impacts come from mental health, community, living conditions, and bushfire economics. So the Ornish program, I'm sure he absolutely loved this like he did in our years. The Ornish program basically encompasses all of essence. Um, it consists of group support, stress management, low-fat vegetarian diet. If you have cancer, then it's a vegan diet. Uh, moderate exercise, cessation of smoking. And so the results are minimizes or prevents cardiovascular disease, slows or stops the progression of early stage prostate, prostate cancer, and increases telomerase, which obviously is good for your telomeres. Um, so it reduces depression, improves your overall blood profile, lowers your BMI, reduces risk of diabetes, all that good stuff. Just know this cycle. It's really not that hard when you think about it. Um, so pre-contemplation is like, I don't need to change. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't have a problem with it. Like other people have a problem with it, but I don't care. Contemplation, it's like, oh, maybe there is something wrong. Like maybe I could change it in the future. Preparations, okay, I want to change, but I don't really know what to do, so I'll go and find some information about how I can get help. Preparation, oh, sorry, action is doing what's needed in order to change. So that might be like so stopping smoking, um, stopping drinking alcohol, I don't know, starting exercise, whatever it is that you're looking to do. Maintenance is you're out of the cycle and the change has been successful, or at least for now, but other people would say that maintenance isn't even a part of it. Eventually you will relapse, but different views. Um, relapse is back into old behaviour, so starting smoking again. Um, and then you can go from relapse straight to contemplation and you might miss that pre-contemplation stage once you go back around or you might need to go back through that whole cycle again. Uh, so changing a habit, the ADEPT model, awareness, decision, effort, persistence and tolerance of discomfort. So, again, these are things that you just have to write down. Again, with SMART goals. So specific means you need to have a clear goal in mind. Um, it shouldn't be vague at all. It's like I want to lose some weight how much, why, when, all that sort of thing. Measurable needs to be able to see progress so that they feel achievement. So if you're talking about weight loss, it's 
taking photos, taking measurements, looking at the scales. So they need to be able to have some physical way of measuring their progress. Attractive obviously needs to be desirable to them so that they want to stick to it. So they have to want to lose the weight. Um, maybe there's something up coming up that you can motivate them with, like, oh, do you have a special event that you want to lose the weight by, all that sort of thing. Um, realistic, if it's not achievable, then basically they'll just be discouraged and feel a sense of failure. So they're like, why would I want to do that when I'm just going to fail? So for someone who's like 150 kilos, it's not really unrealistic for them to lose 20 kilos. But if someone's 40 kilos, then it's very unrealistic for them to want to lose 20 kilos. Um, and then timely. So it needs to fit a specific time frame so that their progress can be measured. And then it also gives them a deadline, so something to work towards. Uh, so BAS goals, behaviour, what people do, attitude, what people think, skills, what people can do, and knowledge, what people understand. This is more about the likelihood of someone being able to achieve their goals, where SMART is like the specific preparation for the goal. So question. What percentage of people using CAMS for serious medical conditions do not inform their doctor? D? <laughs> well done. So Jane, a long-term social smoker who enjoys posting it on her Snapchat every time she goes out, has finally decided to quit her habit and has contacted her GP for some advice on specific addiction programs. What stage of the cycle is she on? Well done. After learning about the wonderful effects exercise can have on both the mind and body, Calvin constantly preaches to his friends and family and really anyone else that he talks to about how often he goes to the gym. If Calvin was trying to prevent himself from developing one of these conditions, what type of exercise is not the suggestion for the type of prevention? Well done. Right before his end of semester exams, a diligent year two medical student discovered he may in fact have contracted the Epstein-Barr virus. For the next weeks, he finds it extremely difficult to sleep as he is worried he will not be able to study and be sick at the same time. What is this medical student suffering from? So this one's stress. So he has a perceived inability to cope. So he feels like if he's sick, he wouldn't be able to cope with sitting his exam. He's not necessarily worried about the exam itself. So anxiety is worrying about the future event. So that would be like worrying about her, sorry, his performance on the exam. Um, it wouldn't be burnout because he doesn't have any other signs of this. Um, it might, increased allostatic load might arise if it was over a prolonged period of time, but we're just talking about he's found out he's got it, he's freaking out. Um, is probably quite possible, and you'd probably argue that too. But what is not a component of the Ornish program? So, C. So, the vegan diet is only for cancer. And now we're moving on to HKS. I'm sure this is your favourite out of all of them. So, Australia's healthcare system, health determinants, Indigenous health, HIV, and AIDS access to healthcare, refugees in asylum seeker health and pharmaceutical industry. So just know this definition, but then also know that it's not perfect. So there are limitations in that it excludes anyone with a chronic illness from ever being healthy because they don't have a complete state of physical health. And then the term complete is actually very difficult to attain and measure. It might be different from person to person. So primary healthcare is essential healthcare based on practical, scientifically sound and socially acceptable methods and technology, made universally accessible to individuals and families in the community. And it's available to all, easy to access and encourages self-reliance and self-determination. It's not so much about medicine but more about the social development, so like what structures are in place to provide healthcare to people. Did you guys learn this new money? Oh, no, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. Well, PIMP first. So provision of essential drugs, immunisation, maternal and child health care, prevention of endemic diseases, food and nutrition, education about health, supply of water and sanitation, and treatment of common illnesses. 
So these are basically all of your elements of primary health care. And it's really useful in trying to figure out what primary health care is if you just remember this. So the types of health care that you can have are primary care. So that's sort of like your GP, your dentist, your physiotherapist. They're your first point of contact with the healthcare system. You don't need a referral. You can just call up, make an appointment, walk straight in. Where it's just secondary care, they're your specialists. So you need a referral to see them. So like if you're going to get a scan or something like that, you'll need a referral to book these scans. So, so the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. And so they influence the health of the individuals. They can be positive or negative factors and can be modifiable or immodifiable. So proximal determinants are directly associated with a change in health status. So if you were to stop smoking or change your diet, that's a proximal determinant. Whereas an intermediate determinant are material factors like how much you earn, so your social economic status. And then your distal determinants indirectly influence health. So policies like the ones where you're not allowed to smoke within a certain area of public places, they're your distal determinants. I'm sure you've all seen that model. It's just really important to know the different levels and how they all influence each other. Um, structure versus agency. So structure is basically the decisions that have already been made for the individuals, like I was saying before, like the no smoking in public places, all that sort of thing. Like they don't get a choice in that. Whereas agency is a person choosing a particular behaviour. So choosing to seek help about how to stop their smoking habits or choosing to smoke, whatever. So structure made for them, agency making their own decisions. So equality versus equity, this has probably been done to death as well. Just know that equality is equal distribution, whereas equity is fair distribution. So equity wants to achieve equal outcomes, but to do that, usually you need to use positive discrimination. So give some more than others, give some more attention than others, that sort of thing. Um, so access and equity. Horizontal equity is pretty much equality and vertical equity is you need equal access, equal utilisation and equal treatment to achieve equal outcomes. So they're just different subcategories, I suppose. Uh, indigenous health, this is a really important component of your course just did you guys get an online thing about this just do it <laughs> as much as you don't want to do it just do it that's where all the exam questions come from um yeah <laughs> um so basically just know that indigenous populations have health inequality due to low social social economic status racism and discrimination, less employment opportunities, poor housing, living in regional, rural or remote areas, poor access to healthcare and culturally insensitive healthcare structure. That last one's really important. That was pretty much what our entire nine mark question was based around. Yes. Uh, last year we had just like, it was sort of like an online lecture that we just had to like click through and did you guys have something like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll talk to someone about it afterwards and see if it's the same thing we had. If not, I can see if I can access the one that we had and send it to you guys because basically it's just everything that they push at you about Indigenous people throughout the year. So, yeah, the last one's really important. We have like a nine-mark question where you had to... Um, explain why the different strategies that they were putting in place were going to be effective in helping the Indigenous population get access to healthcare. I just had to bullshit all nine questions because I didn't really pay much attention to that. So it is really important and it's an easy way to get some marks. So all that sort of stuff, being culturally aware, I'll just leave that for you to read in your own time and that'll be in the slides that you guys are given. Um, so cultural blindness is the tendency to treat everyone the same, it's like not taking into account that some people have different cultural beliefs, some people have different things that they need addressed more than others. So um, it's often due to miscommunication and 
institutionalized racism, whereas cultural safety is like the opposite and ensures respect for cultural and social differences. So like the use of hab of Aboriginal healthcare workers. I don't know if you guys have done like that at Chu program or whatever that sort of thing. That's what they're talking about there. Um, and then just have a read of that in your own time. Basically, it's showing that we're doing really shit at closing the gap. Um, so stigma is the disapproval of a person or group based on the perceptions of them, whereas discrimination is sort of like your actions. Um, so it's unjust or prejudice, unjust prejudice treatment of different groups of people, often on the grounds of race, sex, or age. And it's an active process. Active processes are necessary to change discriminative behaviour. So it's not going to change itself. You actually need to go out there and be like, no, I won't think of them differently because they're a different race. Um, yeah. So prevention, an upstream approach aims to eradicate, eliminate or minimise the impact of disease and disability. It's often more effective to focus on the whole population rather than on higher risk individuals only. So you guys would have all done that like stream approach, it's like upstream, downstream, midstream. Basically they're just saying like if you target the problem before it's a problem then you're not going to have to deal with it at the end. It's more economic for our healthcare system if we do that rather than trying to spend all this money helping this person get better like if we can stop them from getting there in the first place and that's going to be a lot easier so this is the like upstream approach that i was to talking about so your primordial would be like the taxation of cigarettes so if you make them more expensive people are going to be less likely to buy them so you prevent that <coughs> risk factor from occurring in the first place um, your primary prevention would be something like a person quitting smoking so you're stopping them from developing the disease. Secondary prevention, the buzzword there is screening. So those breast cancer screens that go along, stuff like that. Basically, every time you see screening, just go bam, secondary, and you'll get the question. Uh, tertiary provides rehabilitation and prevents further complications in patients with chronic disease and significant complications. So that would be like, if someone has a heart attack and then they come into your clinic and you're giving them a statin or something to try and reduce them from having further heart attacks. <coughs> so that's all in a nice table for you that you can look over in your own time. Uh, many social factors are involved in the spread of HIV and AIDS. You can get horizontal and vertical transmission, so you guys know, like between people and then also like if your mother has it when she gives birth to you, across the placenta, that sort of thing. That's the difference between horizontal and vertical. Um, there's a whole bunch of high-risk populations and 95% are in developing countries. So that's really important to note. That goes along with like social economic status, that sort of thing. Um, so a refugee is a person who has been forced to leave their country to escape war. Sorry about, I can see that typo straight there, about that e-health, health. Um, country to escape war, persecution of natural disaster. Asylum seeker is a person who has left their home country to seek asylum in another. They have applied for refugee status but have not yet been granted it. So that's basically the main thing to recognise there. Um, and then obviously these people generally have poor healthcare outcomes because of their low social and economic status, poor access to health and, as before, the discrimination. So our current healthcare system is unsustainable. We have all these old people who are retiring, so that means less people contributing to tax, all that fun stuff that I'm sure you guys love learning about. So just look over that in your own time as well. Um, basically the idea with private health insurance, it is important because it reduces burden on the public sector, so then it reduces the strain on Medicare. But this also means that there is an increasing funding for the private sector and this allows them to become a larger stakeholder, which means they have a greater opportunity to influence health policies and that sort of thing, which might not be ben um, beneficial for the public sector in the long run. And then obviously doctors are going to be attracted to these private sectors because you get to work in better hospitals, get paid more, all that sort of thing. Um, global pharmaceuticals, boring. <laughs> um, yeah, read over that narrative. <laughs> um, so, which social determinant is non modifiable? Yes. Uh, which of these is not an element of primary health care? Screening for genetic diseases. 
So although there's prevention of endemic diseases, there's nothing about screening for genetic diseases. So before attending a night out in the city, a group of friends decided to get together and have a couple of bevies. It's common knowledge in the group that Zach can be a bit of a lightweight and only needs a couple of drinks before he's munching in an Uber. Meanwhile, Geordie is a self-proclaimed rowing champion and hardly feels the effects of alcohol at all. Given this information, what would be the most equitable way to split the 10-pack of cruises they picked up for the night? <laughs> that? <laughs> Got an answer for me? <laughs> so equity is about equal outcomes. So basically you just want to get them both the same amount of litmus and they might not need the same amount of drinks to do that. So A is equal but it's not equitable and B would result in inequity. D might be equitable, but it's probably not the most correct. And then E would, wouldn't be entertaining for anyone to watch. So <laughs> we'll go with C. What factor does not contribute to the low health of the Indigenous population? Hands up for A. Hands up for B. Hands up for C, hands up for D, hands up for E. So it's E. So the healthcare is available to them, but it's not accessible. So watch out for words like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like we don't have doctors. We just don't have culturally safe doctors and we don't have practices that are put in place to accommodate for these people. So moving on to mom. Mind-body relationships, learning theories, developmental theories, stress and illness, prevention and change, and pain. <laughs> so there's different explanations for the placebo effect. So conditioning is like taking the medicine, you're conditioned to feel better. So it's like every time you take Panadol, you know that you feel better. So when you take it, regardless if you actually feel better or not, you think you do. Um, a perception is taking med medications doesn't affect the symptoms, just the patient's perceptions of them. So it's like taking a vitamin and then going, oh, my God, I've got all this energy because look at me, I'm worshipping my body and I'm putting vitamins in me. <laughs> Validation is health professional doesn't give the medication unless it's warranted. So this obviously is like, oh, the doctor's not going to give it to me unless it's actually doing something. So this medication is obviously working. Um, and then there's also physiological explanations. So endorphins reduce, you get reduced stress from, the, from having the placebo. So then the pain relieving happy hormones are released and that like blocks the gate, all that sort of thing that we'll talk about later. Um, reduced stress also dampens the effects within the body. So if you have like an inflammation or something like that, if you're not stressing, then your inflammatory response won't be as bad. And then the last one is immune function is affected cognitively due to relief. So it's like it's a similar to the psychological. It's basically the, the gate theory. We'll get there later. Um, so attribution is the process of interfering with the causes of mental states and behaviours on yourself and others. So external would be like I had a heart attack due to the stress that was in my family. Um, an internal would be I had a heart attack due to smoking and eating too much fatty food. Um, a stable would be never being able to exercise. Um, unstable would be not being able to exercise just because it's too hot. Um, global, something like diabetes affects all aspects of my life, like who I am, people that are defined by their condition, whereas specific is just like, Diabetes prevents me from eating uh, foods with high sugar. So it's not like it's controlling their whole life. Um, controllable would be something like I can control my diet. Um, there's actually something I can do to change, whereas uncontrollable is like they get diagnosed with something and it's like, no, nothing I can do. I've got it. Um, can't do anything to change it, so why would I even try? So errors of attribution. The fundamental attribution error is the tendency for observers to underestimate the impact of external and overestimate the impact of internal. 
So favours internal attribution to explain a person's behaviour. So he's depressed because he's lazy and can't keep a job. Or his illness return because of the absence of appointments for maintenance treatment. Whereas the actor observer bias is the tendency for the actor to favour the external attributions for their own behaviour, especially if negative. So that's basically like putting the blame on someone else for your own health. Um, Self-serving biases are biases that protect, enhance or enhance self-evaluation. So that self-enhancing bias is attributing one's success to personal factors. So I passed the test because I had great study techniques and I learned the subject, whereas self-protecting bias is attributing, one, attributing one's failures to situational factors. So I failed the test because I had family problems and I had to think about other things at that time and couldn't study properly. Um, well, the self-handicapping bias, I'm probably all had some like experience with this before and someone's like, oh, I'm going to be so bad and fail. And it's like, they're setting themselves up in case they do fail so that they don't look so bad if they do. Um, so attitude is relatively enduring organisation of beliefs, feelings and behaviours, tendencies towards specific people, objects or issues. Um, so your cognition is your belief, ideas or thoughts that people hold about a matter. So something like thinking that the medication will make you feel better um, and the effect is emotions or feelings stimulated by a subject or matter. So I don't mind taking the tablets but I worry about the disease. Um, behavioural intentions are predispositions to act in a certain way towards an object. So um, they're more likely to adhere to a, to a prescribed dose. Uh, this is the discrepancy between attitudes or attitude and behaviour that results in a state of psychological tension. So cognition, the vac vaccination will protect me, but they also cause autism. The effect is I want to be protected, but I don't want to be autistic. And then behavioural intention is you're less likely to vaccinate. So learning is the relatively permanent change in behaviour or potential behaviour that occurs as a result of prior experiences. There's two learning theories. Do you guys understand these? <coughs> Were they pretty straightforward? I'll skip over those and you can read them in your own time. Same with this one. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> and then also I'll just leave these here for you. I won't go through all of those. I'll just put them in a nice table for you. Do you guys learn about those? No. Okay. I had someone say that no and then some other people said yes, so I just left them in there, but I'll take them out before. They're uploaded for you guys, so don't freak out about them. They were really boring anyway. Do you guys do APGAR index? No. ICL? If it's in ICL, you have to know it. So I'll just leave it. Just look over it in case. Um, so there's three approaches to studying stress. Stress as an external stimulus. Stress as a transaction between external event and an individual's reaction and stress as an internal psych physiological reaction. So external stress is an outside force that has a physical or psychological effect on the mind and body. So different events can stress people differently. So someone might be preparing for exams right now and feel like if someone says hello to them, they'll probably cry. Uh, whereas other people might be still going out every night and not even worried about exams. So this life events theory, it doesn't take into account external events related to health and it doesn't take into account how people cope with stress and individual and cultural preferences to events like divorces and breakups. Like for some people, divorce is fine, it's a normal part of life, whereas other cultures might be like, as soon as you're divorced, you're shunned from the family, that sort of thing. So it doesn't in, it doesn't take into account cultural differences like that. Um, transa transactional stress it considers the nature of the stress and the nature of the person experiencing the stress. So it's like primary and secondary appraisal. So primary is how the subject appraises the event and secondary is how the subject appraises their resources and their ability to cope, which can be influenced by a variety of things. Uh, internal stress is how the body responds to stress and it involves the autonomic nervous system and the neuroendocrine system. 
So your fight and flight or your rest and digest. So stress activates the fight or flight response. And you have all these bad impacts of stress that were mentioned before. Um, so different types of stress, acute stress. So first one's like PTSD. So big events initially cause panic, anxiety, and anger. And then you can have triggers that cause flashbacks and you feel like you're reliving this event, but it doesn't last for a long period of time. And you can have routine, which are like your exams. So it's for a little bit longer than your typical just acute bout of stress, but it's not going to be there forever. It's just for a one-off event or that sort of thing. Um, whereas chronic stress is like prolonged stress and workplace is a very common place that people get this because obviously you're going back there every day and chronic stress can lead to burnout. So there's the direct root of illness where direct physiological changes in the endocrine and immune system, which is where we were talking about before about chronic inflammation and that sort of thing. And then indirect route of illness, so by responses to the stress. So if you're stressed and you start smoking, start drinking more, or you might not be eating, or you might not be sleeping. Um, and then stress activates the sympathetic nervous system, so your fight or flight response, um, which is bad for heart disease, hypertension, smoking, most bowel diseases, IBS, multiple sclerosis, all that good stuff. And then factors modifying the impact of stress of health, so basically, like, yeah, same stuff. It just repeats on and on. So once you get it, you kind of you get it. Um, so coping reduces the impact of perceived stress, which decreases negative emotions. So you can have adaptive or maladaptive coping strategies. So your adaptive, uh, good, maladaptive, bad. You, so you can have problem versus emotion-focused coping. So problem-focused is about planning, confronting, and seeking information. The key words there are planning and information, whereas emotion-focused is support-seeking, venting, praying, reframing. So basically finding someone to talk to it about. Um, you can have cognitive responses, helplessness, acceptance, or perceived benefits. Different personality traits, I'll leave those for you to read over in your own time. Um, so pain, going back to this, what we said before about the gate control theory. So everyone has like a pain threshold and it might be different, similar for everyone, but the pain tolerance is the degree of tolerance before it becomes too much for them. So I'm trying to think of an example, I don't know. Some, you know when someone like breaks their arm or something, like two people, they feel the same, they have the same pain threshold. So they've got a broken arm, they can feel that it's broken, it hurts. But someone might be like sobbing uncontrollably and another person's like, oh, wow, it just broke my arm. That's pretty cool. Um, so people have a different tolerance. Um, so the gate control theory sees pain as a perception. So it explains thoughts and emotions influencing pain and perception. Um, so the gate mechanisms to control feelings of pain are opened or closed by three factors, and these are the ones that you want to remember. So the activity in pain fibres opens the gate. The activity in other sensory nerves closes the gate. And then messages from the brain concentrating on pain or not thinking about it. So it's basically saying that if you like rub or touch the affected area, it closes the gate. So like if you hurt your finger and you go like that or like rub it or something, that actually does help you to not feel the pain as much because you're activating other nociceptive fibres around that area. So it's like less of one specific area and your body's kind of can't figure out where the pain's coming from exactly. Um, factors that open the gate and lead to more pain, negative thoughts, memory of the pain or life situational crises. Factors that close the gate, uh, medications, relaxation, all that meditation again, good distractions and aerobic exercise. So the gate control theory is really good because it allows for the interpretation of injury without pain. So you guys heard about that like phantom limb syndrome? Yeah, that's what that's talking about. Um, and then, yeah. So the other day when Tom got a headache at university, he decided to take two Panadols, which helped it go away. Today when Tom felt another headache coming on, he took another two Panadols. This is an example of which type of learning. Yeah, so it's C. So it's reinforcement because the consequences of getting rid of his headache are more likely to make him repeat the behaviour. 
for taking the Panadol, but it's negative because you're taking something bad away. So you're taking the headache away from him, so negative. So Emily is feeling extremely stressed about her exam tomorrow, even though she has been studying really hard. This is an example of which type of stress? Yeah, so it's really A and D, so D is a subcategory of A. Because Emily was feeling very stressed about her exam, she decided she would come to all of the revision lectures and PSP sessions. This is an example of which type of coping strategy. Yeah, so she's seeking information. A key advantage of the gate control theory over biomedical models of pain is that the gate control theory what? Yeah, and that was actually a question from our exam last year. So the great ones. Etc. Etc. Because no one wants to learn about it anyway. So I'll try and go over it really quickly. Um, ethical theories. Just know those and know how to like talk your way through those. Um, I think that was another extended response question we had, and it was like, what ethical theories are most applicable here? Um, so just know those ones. Principles of medical eth ethics. Same one. Basically, it's just like autonomy is the main one you need to know about. Autonomy is going to be relevant in every single scenario. So if you don't know, it's autonomy. Um, so strong paternalism is intervention to protect a ben or benefit a patient despite their voluntary, informed and capable refusal of course of action desired by the doctor. So that would be like a doctor forcing a Jehovah's Witness to get a blood transfusion even though it's against their will. So you're trying to make them better, but they don't want to. Um, weak paternalism is an intervention to protect or benefit a patient who is suspected of not being capable to make an autonomous decision. So that's like a doctor making a decision to treat a patient who's under the influence of alcohol or drugs or you're a child because you're not able to make that decision by yourself. So taught of battery, um, I found this really interesting to learn about. So like if a doctor came in and tripped over his chair and hit his patient and dislocated their knee, that wouldn't be taught of battery, but it can be taught of battery if he just walks in and like touches the chick on his on her back and was like, "Hi, how are you doing today?" Like that's how stupid it is. Um, so it's intentional contact without the patient's consent. So in the case of him tripping, he didn't mean to trip, so it wasn't intentional. Um, whereas in the other one, he meant to touch her on the back, so that's intentional, and you don't need physical injury. It's just someone being like, I didn't want you to touch me. Um, and then negligence is a breach of care or duty resulting in an unintended injury. For requirements for negligence, duty of care was present. The doctor breaches the duty of care. There is an injury due to the breach and the injury was foreseeable. So it didn't have to happen. Um, remember just the VIC model. So voluntary, informed and has the capacity. And then just remember that consent can be oral or written. And then implied consent, so that's sort of like if a doctor comes in and he goes, I need to take your blood pressure, and you start like rolling up your sleeve. So you're, you're pretty much implying that you're fine to, or you're, it's fine for him to put the cuff on your arm. So you don't actually need to say, yes, that is fine. You can may put the blood cuff on my arm. Uh, confidentiality is the key to any doctor-patient relationship. So it's basically just saying like what's said in a doctor's office should stay in a doctor's office unless it needs to be disclosed for any reason. Um, so basically, I think the rule of MedCamp, like what happens at MedCamp stays at MedCamp. Um, so these are the conditions when you can break confidentiality. So if the patient consents or if the information is de-identified, the information is being shared within a healthcare team. So that's when you're like, all information will be kept confidential between you, me, and the treating team for that. Um, or if there's a threat to public safety or if they believe the patient is a threat to themselves. And then the situations where the doctors must disclose information is there has been a notifiable disease, if there's been medical <coughs> malpractice, if there's been child abuse, drug or drink driving, or if you think there's been any of those, um, if it's required by the court or police, if there's a reportable death or a threat to public health and safety. So they're all the conditions for a reportable death that you guys can read over. And that is the end. So 
don't stress. You'll be okay. It's not the end of the world. Please get degrees, guys. Um, do some meditation. You'll be right. <laughs> Um, also, I'll stick out five for like five or ten minutes if you guys have any other questions. Come ask me, or my email's on the slides, or I don't think anyone actually uses email, so just message me on Facebook or something like that. How was it? Oh, yeah. Oh, cancer and hematology. I'm not so sure that is a cow. We don't have time, so that. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> So you must be like, oh yeah, why does this girl have like 192 slides? Um, so like, I, I, I didn't realize you guys hadn't done anemia. Um, so all those slides are anemia. Also, some of those slides are actually anatomy. So like principles of vascular child, which I'm actually not supposed to cover, but I made those slides because the guy who did the revision lecture for us last year made those slides. Cool. Um, so we better get started because I have a lot of slides. Um, is it okay if I go a little bit into lunch? No, it's not okay. Wait, hands up! If, hands up if it's okay. Okay, hands up if it's not okay. Okay, so it's okay if I go into lunch. Okay. Um. Um. Okay, so we better get started because um, there's a lot to cover. Um. It, if at any stage um, I'm talking about something that you haven't done, please just let me know. We can just flip it and skip those slides. Um, okay, so I'm doing cancer and hematology. My name is Wendy. For those who haven't met me, I'm one of the second years. Um, yeah, and that's my email if you have questions. Um, yeah, so these are the lectures I'm supposed to be covering for cancer, um, including that neoplasia workshop I'm not sure if you guys had. Um, and also, these are the things I'll be covering for hematology minus the anemia because I realized you guys haven't done it. So I moved that to the end of the PowerPoint in case people wanted to do a bit of light reading for fun. Um, yeah, like because it's, it's important, it's just you won't be tested on this exam. And um, yeah, 
And also there's a little bit on principles of blood vessels and vasculature, which we won't have time for today. Um, okay, these are my references. So like I use a lot of uh, material from the Numus notes on Numus.org. I highly recommend my high notes for every lecture. And then year three, two Chuck Boyle's um, hematology lecture from last year. Um, yeah, I use some of his diagrams as well. Anyway, so cancer, introduction to cancer. So um, cancer occurs when, um, yeah. Cancer occurs when like the cells are growing inappropriately, and so what happens is the cells are growing at an inappropriate time. They grow really fast, which is inappropriate, and they grow in the wrong locations as well. And it's a disease of a single cell, so most cancers will start off from one mutated cell. And um, cancer starts when cell cycle becomes dysregulated, and also um, often cancer cells can avoid apoptosis, so they never die. And so cancers will become immortal because those cells don't die, they just keep on replicating and you form a tumor. And so, yeah. So are you guys familiar with the cell cycle? Cool, yeah, so like RB and P53 are pretty important um, to hold, for holding the cell cycle. And cell cycle is pretty important and it's usually very tightly regulated. And so when you need, when your body needs more cells, um, um, your cells will start dividing, so you get more cell numbers to do the job that your organ needs, and your cells will stop dividing when you have enough cells to do the job. And yeah, and the, the differentiation and division of cells is stimulated by either environmental factors or by um, external, or, or by like uh, growth factor proteins. So a bit more about that. So growth factors are proteins that circulate the blood and they control cell growth, migration, or death. So what happens is these growth factors will bind to cell surface receptors on various cells, and so it will cause the cell to undergo some changes. So uh, when, the, uh, growth, when growth factor binds to the receptor, it will cause um, cell transduction to occur, and so what happens is the signal reaches a nucleus, which tells the nucleus to um, either to, which tells the nucleus to undergo gene transcription to create some sort of protein. And so, um, or what, and the type of protein produced will um, either result in the cell growing, dividing, move, moving, or dying. Um, so, in cancer, growth factors are mutated. Um, and so, there's various ways that growth factors can initiate neoplasia. So sometimes growth factors haven't been switched off quickly enough, so they're active for longer, so they have longer time to stimulate more cells to divide. Or, um, yeah, and also when cancer cells will have mutations in these proteins. Um, cancer, cancer cells may also have mutations in growth factor receptors, so that means even when there's no growth factor, the cell can still divide because the receptor is just permanently permanently switched on. There may also be mutations in intracellular signaling proteins. So that means um, the uh, proteins used for signal transduction are always on and they keep on providing the signal to tell the nucleus to undergo transcription. Um, and also there may be mutations in proteins that switch off um, that switch off um, growth factors. Cool. Cell differentiation, so um, stem cells can produce many different types of cells, and um, cancerous stem cells don't fully differentiate, and so that's a problem. So this is um, what happens normally, is you have a stem cell, it will differentiate into a certain type of daughter cell for a certain function, and then so um, these daughter cells will fully differentiate, and it will become a cell that's useful to us. Or oh, there's a different option where the stem cell doesn't produce any daughter cells, but just continually replicates itself. And so that can form a tumor as well. And the other option is the stem cell, the stem cell does produce a daughter cell, but the daughter cell doesn't differentiate properly. So this daughter cell doesn't do the fun does do the um, doesn't have any function essentially. They don't work properly. And so these daughter cells continue to bind to form a tumor, which is full of useless cells, essentially. Um, so yeah, so tumors are masses of cancer cells to, uh, and they're usually derived, derived from one single mutated cell that undergoes lots of multiplication. So um, uh, you might already know that mutated cells um, go through the cell cycle a lot faster, so there's less time to check their DNA. 
So um, if they sustain more mutations, they'll just continue. They'll just continually divide, and they'll sustain more and more mutations until like the cell is just fucked up, essentially. And um, yeah, and tumorigenesis is a type of clonal expansion. So um, it's where like abnormal cells will grow really fast, and they will replace the neighbor cells who are normal and don't grow as fast. So they'll switch out other cells, and they will grow into a tumor. Um, yeah, and also, and often tumors require more than just one mutation. You often need a lot of mutations for cancer to occur, and this will occur over um, very long periods of time, often decades. And cool. Um, characteristics of cancer. So, um, cancer cells don't have contact in her vision. So, um, I don't know if we talked about like the petri dish example. So, like if you have cells, um, normal cells grow in a petri dish, they will grow until one layer is full and then they won't grow anymore because they're surrounded by other cells and they have no more room to grow, so they'll just stay there and no more cells will divide. But whereas with cancer cells, even if uh, they're already surrounded by other cells, they'll still keep growing and dividing. And also cancer cells are not anchor ridge dependent. So um, in a normal cell, like in a Petri dish, um, the cells, uh, uh, cells will only divide if they're next to um, like the Petri dish. And so they won't, so you have one layer of cell and they won't grow on top of each other. Whereas cancer cells, they can grow even if they're not next to, um, even, if, even if they're not at the bottom of the Petri dish. So they can grow on top and form like a little lump thing. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Tel telomeres. Um, telomeres. You guys know a lot about telomeres. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so telomeres are um, genetic information at the end of chromosomes and they um, define the age of the cells. So every time a cell divides, telomeres will get shorter. And so that's what happens in a normal cell. Um, the thing is, though, telomeres can be added to chromosomes by this um, enzyme called telomerase. And so cancer cells have this ability to turn on this enzyme. And so as a result, um, even if like, there's chromosomal damage, cancer cells can still divide because it can keep on adding on telomeres to the end of chromosomes and causes the cells to be still young. And so it avoids apoptosis and it causes like the cells to just keep on dividing, never die, and become more immortal. So properties of normal versus cancer cells, you can bring that in your own China. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, okay, low yield, I'm gonna skip it, low yield as well. Effects of cancer. Uh, so cancer is the second most common cause of death, uh, and the prognosis of cancer depends on the type of cell that the cancer originated from. And there are some cancers that are often diagnosed quite late, like lung cancer, liver cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And obviously, the quicker the cancer is caught, the more likely you're able to treat it, because um, earlier stages of cancer know that the cells are less normal and are having metastasized. Uh, so phenotypes of cancer. So the change from a normal cancer cell to a uh, to a, from normal cell to a cancer cell is called cell transformation. And so pathologists uh, look under a microscope and they look at the cancer cell. Uh, they look for cancer cells essentially. And cancer cells have a large nuclei, changes to shape, and they have lots of specialized uh, features. And so cancer cell appearance um, changes. Uh, cancer cell appearance change occurs on the spectrum. So the cancer, what, uh, the more malignant it is, the, uh, the more like different to the original cell the cancer would look. So the cancer, cancer would, cancer would be, would look progressively more different to the original cell. And so sometimes uh, cancer cells become so malignant that you can't even tell under the microscope where the cancer has originated from. And so benign versus malignant tumors, they get benign tumors, they look like the tissue they're from, malignant, they don't. Benign tumors grow faster than healthy cells, but not too much, whereas malignant cells spread very quickly. Benign cells are encapsulated, which means that they can't invade other tissues, whereas malignant cancers have invasive edges, they don't have in capsules, so they can invade other tissues. Um, benign uh, cancers remain localized and don't spread. Um, and they typically typically don't cause much problems unless unless they're in the brain because if they become too big, they squish your brain and get fucked. And um, malignant, um, yeah, and malignant cancers will invade. As we already said cells have um, benign cancers have um, similar structures to normal cells, whereas malignant cells don't have similar have irregular structures and don't look like normal cells. Um, benign cells have a normal size nucleus. Malignant cells have a large nucleus because they have um, a lot of cancer cells have 
uh, many chromosomes in their uterus. Um, the nine cells have specialized features, Millennium cells lack specialized features. Cool. So this is an adenoma, which is um, benign. It's in the capsule. It doesn't spread. This is an adenocarcinoma, which is malignant, and it spreads. Nice, normal buccal cells, precancerous buccal cells, and I don't know what the hell that is. Like, it's just so scary. Like, a normal, you know, just becoming increasingly more weird. I don't know. I think cancer cells are kind of scary. I don't know why. They look they look scary. Um, yeah. I don't know, they have like nice, they have really big eyes and stuff. Like, anyway, um, cool. Um, metastasis. So, like, um, so metastasis is a spread of cancer. So, um, we've been talking about this. Cancer starts from a single cell. And so, cancer can spread to other parts of the body and grow. And um, usually, it's a secondary cancer that kills the patient. So, if you have breast cancer, if you have cancer in your breast, you're not likely to die from that. But it's when you express your liver and you have like liver damage, your liver doesn't work properly. Spreads to your brain um, that you like, yeah, you die from that. Um, uh, cool. And uh, cancer cells can secrete proteolytic enzymes to the extracellular matrix so as a way to extend to other tissues and invade other tissues. Um, cool. Yeah. And there are some genetic changes that causes um, causes the cancer cell to not stay in its place. So it doesn't adhere to adjacent cells, so it's more likely that it's going to spread. Um, metastasis can be local or distant. So local metastasis will be like breast cancer spreading to the chest wall and um, loop, uh, whereas distant metastasis is when breast cancer spreads to bones, lungs, whatever. The can areas to which cancer spreads um, depends on the type of cancer, and it's mostly dependent on the inner strainage and the uh, drainage. Um, yeah. Cool, yeah, I said being a strange lip drainage can also be transcelomic through body cavities. So like if you have uh, stomach cancer, you can spread to your pancreas because it's like, yeah, almost right next to each other. Um, intravenous um, so what happens is when the cancer cell wants to spread, um, it goes um, near a blood vessel and it intravasates into the blood vessel and then it'll travel with the, uh, well, it'll intravasate either into a blood vessel vessel or a lymphatic vessel and so um and then so the cancer cell will spread according to where the lymph is traveling and the um blood vessel is traveling and and then once the cancer spreads to a different um the blood the blood supply uh, when, once the cancer is in the blood vessel to travel to a different organ um such as the lung or liver and then once you get to those organs, the capillaries get really small. And because cancer cells are really big, they get stuck in those capillaries and then they attach to the endothelium and so they will extravasate into that tissue. That's, that's how they spread. Um, and once they spread, they can either sit dormant um, and just sit there for ages or they can undergo angiogenesis to survive. Um, cool, angiogenesis is a formation of microcirculation to supply the tumors. And so they're really vital for tumor growth. Because tumor grows really fast, they need a lot of nutrients to grow that fast. And um, they also produce a lot of waste products as a result. And so they need blood vessels to clear that waste. And so cancer cells will secrete vascular endothelial growth factor, which um, will signal to the nearby vessels to grow into them. So, yeah, so they can get nutrients to keep on growing. Local effects of cancer. So, um, yeah, so when cancers grow, uh, when the tumor grows really big, it will squish other cells, and so it will cause healthy cells to die as well. And um, they also, because cancer cells can't, uh, cancer cells don't have the normal function of cells, um, the tissue function deteriorates because there's not enough normal cells to do the job that the organ requires. And um, also, cancer cells can block movements. So um, it can block, um, for example, colon cancer. If you have a really large bowel, you can obstruct the bowel, and so your food contents can't move through the bowel. Um, also, cancer masses can compress nerves, so you get tingling and sensations. It might obstruct blood vessels or lymph, and it'll, it'll result in edema. Um, and also, because if you're if you're obstructing a vessel, your blood can't flow properly, so you can cause ischemia. 
because um, your blood will clot or something like that. Uh, distant effects of cancer. So um, cancer cells um, can metastasize. You know, we'll get through and talk about that. And they, can, they also need to compete with normal cells for nutrition because they need so much nutrition to grow. And so they start stealing the energy and they start breaking up proteins or healthy cells to support themselves. And that's why patients experience weight loss cachexia, which is extreme weight loss, um, fatigue and tiredness because their normal cells can't function, they don't have enough proteins to work properly, and their weight loss occurs because they're taking nutrients from normal cells. Um, also, cancers can secrete hormones, which can cause distant effects. So, like lung cancer can secrete cortisol, which is a hormone, a stress hormone, and it um, causes blood pressure to increase. Uh, cancer dormancy, you can read about that. Basically, cancers can stay dormant for ages. So, even if you're dead of cancers, you have to go through screening your media in case um, there's some cancer cell lying, lying somewhere, which is not able to grow into the appropriate environment. Molecular basis of cancer, so dead, cancer is a disease of DNA. So I uh, need DNA damage to cause cancer. So DNA damage can be inherited. So it could be in one of your mom or dad's, like it could be in your dad's um, um, sperm or um, sorry, or your mom's like eggs. Sorry, um, so, sorry. Um, so like all of your cells in the body, all your cells in the body will have that damaged DNA. And so um, yeah. Or it could be acquired, and that's um, as due to exposures or by carcinogens and environmental factors. So um, DNA mutations can occur in many different ways. It can just occur spontaneously. It can just occur. Or um, it can be caused by exposure to carcinogens, like UV ionizing radiation, don't smoke guys, tobacco is bad, and can be caused in food. And also um, predisposing factors can um, yeah, it can lead to cancer, such as obesity, high fat, low carbon diet, guys, eat your veggies and fruit, they're really, really important. And um, chronic inflammation, that's pretty straightforward. So like, um, so like, um, inflammation damages cells, and so if your cells become too damaged, um, yeah, the DNA gets damaged and cause cancer. Cool. Genetic causes, so, um, um, so, yeah, so like about 10% of all cancers are caused because um, your parents had it, like, um, and familial aggregation occurs because of various reasons. Like, for example, you and your parents will live in the same environment, you will say you will eat the same food, so that's a, a reason why familial aggregation occurs. And also, it could just be genetic disposition, like your father passes on to you, or like whatever. Um, so, like, um, your likelihood of cancer is increased. You have to have many first degree relatives with a common or related cancer, so if your dad had mum, uh, if your dad had like esophageal cancer, your mum had like colon cancer. It's the same system, gastrointestinal, so you're more likely to get a gastrointestinal cancer. And also you're more likely to get it early, under 40 years of age, and you're more likely to, um, and, um, you're probably more likely to get multiple cancers. Um, also, uh, also it's important to note that if you have a family history and you're aware of it, these people generally do a lot to prevent themselves getting cancer. So they have a better prognosis if they're aware of it, that they um, that they have a gene predisposing them to cancer. So they've done so those guys under the like, um, regular screening so they can detect the cancer early. Cool. Genetic changes, um, prevention is really important. Yeah. Genetic counseling can be of great value to people who have a genetic disposition. Right. Acquired causes of cancer. So like uh, have you learned about PIG3? Yes. Very cool. Um, so PIG3 is a protein that holds the cell in the G1 stage until DNA is repaired. Um, and so like it stops the DNA from um, replicating if there's something wrong with the DNA. But if the cell lacks PIG3 and the cell gets damaged through radiation or, or something, that means the cell can still replicate even if, um, even if it's damaged. So that's the importance of PIG3. And so like um, so there's either two options here. So if the cell gets really damaged by radiation, it'll just die, or otherwise they may survive with the genetic mutation and then become cancerous because there's no people who can do something uh, You can get cancer from microorganisms. So it's like 15% of all cancers. So if they're, um, yeah, so viruses can be, have been known to cause like cervical cancer. So that's like human papillomavirus, um, HPV, or liver cancer or lymphomas. Um, so what happens is, um, Viruses incorporate their DNA into uh, can in, can incorporate their DNA into the host cell's um, DNA, and so the host cell uh, so they might actually insert 
the viral DNA into like a critical gene that then that cell growth. And so you'll end up producing proteins that are like overly active or something, and so you, that'll cause cancer. Another fact of a bacteria is can also cause cancer, like Helicobacter pylori, lives in your stomach. So almost 50% of the world population have um, Helicobacter pylori in their stomach. And so they interfere with cellular functions and they can lead to a gastric cancer. Um, acquired causes, benzopyrene from charcoal meat, aflatoxins from moldy peanuts, moldy peanuts, you can eat normal peanuts, okay. Um, cool, um, older people are generally more likely to get cancer because they've lived for longer, their cells have been around for longer, so they've had more time to sustain multiple DNA mutations, and, and cancer takes um, ages to form. So even if you have cancer, you might, some of you guys might have cancer cells right now, and you won't know until like 40 years later when you sustain more mutations and the cells grow really fast. Okay, low fiber, high fat diet. I'm not saying all of you have, just a couple, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, low fiber, high fat diet is associated with cancer because it got eaten on vegetables. Cool. Cells, uh, cells are uh, rapidly dividing cells that generally are more susceptible to DNA damage. So they've got epithelial cells, your gut cells, your um, epithelial cells, and like your skin cells, your gut cells, etc. And um, yeah, so if the cells have enough mutations and they have loss of DNA repair enzymes, so the DNA doesn't get repaired, and also if there's like a more rapid cell cycle. Um, DNA mutations will accumulate and the cells may start becoming cancerous. So um, when you look at a cancer cell, generally there's probably over seven different mutations for cancer to actually form. Okay, so that's just a random number. I think it might not necessarily be seven. Or well, my point is you need a lot of mutations to get cancer. Okay, penetrance is the proportion of people with a genetic disposition to cancer who will actually develop cancer. So, like, if you, if your, if both your parents have breast cancer, it's possible for males to get breast cancer. By the way, so if your mom and dad both have breast cancer, you might actually not get breast cancer. And so, it depends on the level of penetrance. So, penetrance is variable, and it depends on the type of cancer. So, some colon cancers are hundred percent, hundred percent have a hundred percent penetrance. Um, whereas breast cancer usually is like 40 to 70 percent penetrance, so you know the type of breast cancer. Non penetrance is when like your parents have a cancer, but you don't actually get the cancer. Anticipation is when you develop the cancer at an earlier age than your parents. So if your parents got around um, 60, you might be on like 40 or 30. Phenocopy is pretty annoying, it's when like you don't actually have the genes for the cancer. Um, uh, okay, so your parents have the cancer, but they didn't pass the gene to you. But you still develop the cancer because of environmental reasons anyway. So that's called phenocopy, and it's really annoying when you're um, looking at family pedigrees because it confuses people because they're not sure if, like, yeah, it's genetic or not. Okay, genes are regular cancer oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, and mismatch repair genes. Um, proto oncogenes are actually normal genes, proto oncogenes are normal, and they regulate cell growth and division. They're really important for the growth. Cells. There's five major classes growth factors, growth factor receptors, intracellular signaling molecules, transcription factors, and cell cycle control and apoptosis proteins. Am I speaking too fast? No? Okay, cool. <laughs> yes? No? So I just have a lot of content to cover. I'm really sorry. Um, a lot of the information is on the slides, okay? I, I put a lot of information. Cool. Oncogenes are overexpressed proto oncogenes, okay? And so what happens is mutations to proto oncogenes can turn them into oncogenes. So that means all these um, growth uh, growth factors, growth factor receptors are overexpressed. And so that means, um, yeah, so uh, there'll be like increased activity of um, the genes that are norm normally used for cell growth. So that means you have extreme cell growth. And so um, oncogenes signal the cells to divide inappropriately. And um, it's important to know that uh, you only need one mutant copy of the oncogene to get cancer. Uh, so RAS is a signaling molecule and it's often mutated in cancer. Cyclin CDK uh, can be mutated as well, and there are um, proteins that control cell cycle. And MYC, and I don't know. MYC is a transcription factor that can be also in cancer. So they're all um, examples of oncogenes. Yeah, so transformation oncogenes. So you can have an act 
activating or gain of function mutation. So it's a mutation in your proto oncogene that makes the gene overly active. And so, uh, not overly active. So it makes the gene produce a mutant protein that's overly active. And so, um, yeah, and there's another way that um, you can transfer proto oncogenes to oncogenes, that's gene amplification. So that means the actual gene is normal, but it's just overly expressed. So you, you produce too much of the normal protein. Uh, trans, uh, chromosomal translocation are also um, for oncogenes. Cool. Activating mutation. So RAS is an example of uh, oncogene, and it's attached to the inner surface of receptors. So um, if RAS gets a point mutation, it can be switched on permanently, even if there's no um, ligand to bind to the receptor. So um, yeah, so it's always active, and it'll cause the cell to survive, blah, blah, blah. Gene amplification, so yeah, like I talked about before, normal gene, but it's just a lot of normal gene, normal protein, but a lot of it being produced. Example is EGFR2. Chromosomal translation is when my chromosomes break off and join another chromosome, and it occurs with really high levels of UV, smoking, don't smoke, guys, um, and chemical exposure. Um, so yeah, so like, uh, for example, chromosome 18 and 14 can undergo a translocation and cause the MYC thing to be transcribed too rapidly and leads to lymphoma. Cool. Ways her own genes can become oncogenes, I already explained all of them. Tyrosine kinases. Um, so tyrosine kinases are a type of um, receptor in a lot of cells, and they're often mutated in cancers. Actually, I found this really hard to understand last year. I actually had to look it up properly yesterday as well, so I can be slow. Um, so what happens is like, so for example, this is a tyrosine kinase. What happens is um, a growth factor or something will bind, normally, a growth factor will bind to the tyrosine kinase and it will change the shape of the tyrosine kinase into cellularly. And so it'll change the shape so that it'll be able to bind to ATP. And so what ATP binds, it releases a uh, phosphate. Um, uh, and so this phosphate will attach to the protein kinase. And so this is called phosphorylation. And so what happens is with the phos uh, when the phosphate is attached to the protein kinase, um, this can allow other, trans uh, other transcription factors or like protein signaling factors to be activated. And so that's what happens normally. And also uh, it's possible that when, uh, when growth factors bind to tyrosine kinases, it will cause the tyrosine kinases to become more close together. And so they can actually phosphorylate each other, or well, another option is they can auto-phosphorylate themselves. Um, but what happens is in cancer, um, the growth factors will still bind to the receptor, but it doesn't really matter whether they bind or not. The tyrosine kinase, because it's mutated, it'll have, like, it will have a different shape from the normal tyrosine kinase intracellularly, and so that means like ATP can always bind to a tyrosine kinase, whether there is a uh, um, ligand bind to the receptor or not. And so even when there's no growth factor, ATP can still um, bind to the tyrosine kinase, the tyrosine kinase can still become phosphorylated, and it can interphosphorylate other proteins and cause like cells to divide. Cool, some diagrams on how tyrosine kinases work. They all work a little bit differently, but it's generally the same principle. Okay, they, they become phosphorylated, they can activate other proteins. Um, chronic myelogenous leukemia, did you guys learn about CML? Yeah. Yes, okay, cool. So it's it's an example of chromosomal translocation. So it's a nine, chromosome 9 and 22 translocation. It's known as the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, so the gene, gene we're talking about here is the able tyrosine kinase gene on the um, ninth chromosome, and when it, fu and it fuses with the BCR gene on the on chromosome 22. And so, uh, what happens is when your uh, nucleus goes to transcribe this tyrosine kinase, it'll actually transcribe a fusion protein, so the normal tyrosine kinase, and it um, causes an upregulation of tyrosine kinase leading to leukemia. And um, yeah, CML results from a single of normal hematopoietic stem cell. And we don't know why this mutation occurs. And so this leads to like a proliferation of immature and non-functional lymphocytes. Um, so these white blood cells don't work. They just keep on, and they displace like the normal cells in the bone marrow, and um, it's really bad. Cool. Yep. Uh, did you guys learn about imatinib? No? 
Treatment of CML, no, cool. Treatment of uh, tyrosine kinase cancers. Yes, okay, cool. Three types of um, medications. ATP competitive inhibitors. So like if we go back to here, so this is a um this is a tyrosine kinase, cool. And so what happens is ATP will bind to the tyrosine kinase so that like um, the tyrosine kinase will become phosphorylated and you know cause an effect in the cell. What happens is um what happens is um, ATP competitive inhibitors, what they do is they bind to the um, spot on the tyrosine kinase that ATP usually binds to, and so this stops ATP from binding. So it stops the tyrosine kinase from being phosphorylated, and so it stops like, all this um, cell signaling. Um, Anti-tyrosine kinase and antibodies, so what happens is uh, these are essentially tyrosine kinase receptor antagonists. So they bind to the tyrosine uh, kinase, and so they yeah, stop phosphorylation. Also, they have another effect. They have um, cytotoxicity, so they can actually destroy the surprising kinase. Anti-angiogenics, so pretty simple. Can the tumor requires angiogenesis to survive, so anti-angiogenics stops, um, yeah, so stops the um, tumor from secreting BEGF, and so stops the tumor from growing. Tumor suppressor genes, so these are normal genes, um, and they involve this uh, cell cycle regulation, and so they include like transcription factors, cell surface proteins, DNA repair proteins, and apoptosis related proteins. Um, some of these actually overlap with oncogenes, by the way. Uh, so, and they control checkpoints in the cell cycle. So, normally they control the G1 to S phase, and um, examples are retinal blastoma and PPP3. So, they stop the cell from actually synthesizing the. Synthesizing, synthesizing and replicating DNA. Um, yeah, so they negatively, negatively control cell growth and they're kind of like the breaks in the cell. So um, TSG mutations are actually muscle function mutations. And so you actually need to lose, and they follow the two hit hypothesis, so you need to lose like two copies of the gene for cancer to develop. Retinoblastoma, do you know learn about this? Yes, cool. It's a uh, it's a tumor suppressor gene that uh, regulates cell progression. And so it also follows the two hypothesis, obviously. Um, yeah, and so what happens is people who are born with this gene uh, are usually born with one mutant copy. You can't be born with two mutant copies. That's a lead for genotype, so you'll die in the womb. Um, so when you're born with one copy, um, if you sustain the uh, mutation in the other copy of the gene, um, it's more likely um, that you will get cancer because all of your cells have that mutant copy of the gene. And so what happens to people with hereditary retinoblastoma, they were born with a mutant gene in all of their cells of their body, including cells in their eyes. And so if they sustain another mutation in any of the cells in their eye, they'll develop they'll, they'll, they'll cancer called retinoblastoma and it causes blindness in people's eyes. It's really sad because, um, yeah, and, um, yeah, and, but unfortunately, it also predisposes you to other cancers because all the cells in your body have it. And so if any of my skin cells, if I have the mutant gene, any of my skin cells, skin, skin cells sustain another mutation, it, I'll probably get like skin cancer or something. Um, Non-hereditary form of retinoblastoma is very rare because you need to develop two mutant copies of the gene during your lifetime. Um, yeah, so usually retinoblastoma in non hereditary form, hereditary form to at an early age. Cool. Ways you can get the RB mutation, you can look at that in your own spare time. I don't think you get tested on that actually. UPV3 is um, control cell apoptosis, okay? It causes cell apoptosis when the DNA is too damaged, essentially, and it's present, an absence of P53 is present in 50% of tumors, so that's a bit confusing. Um, so what happens is, um, yeah, P53 um, contributes, also contributes to DNA repair. So this um, damaged DNA, it'll signal to like um, other genes to repair the DNA, essentially. And, um, but if the DNA is too damaged, it'll cause this um, cell to die. It'll tell the cell to undo it, apoptosis. And so if a P53 is damaged, sorry, if the, if the P53 is mutated, um, and it loses its function, it prevent, uh, it, there's no longer any prevention for the replication of damaged DNA. So I mean, even if your DNA gets damaged, um, you can still replicate your DNA. Because there's no 50p3 from stopping it. Cool. Yep. Um, yep. Lost early in skin cancer. 
because of UV induced point mutation. So it allows cancer cells to escape apoptosis, no regulation of cell cycle checkpoints. Cool. Um, but it's not sufficient to cause can skin cancer on its own. Remember what I said, we need lots of mutations to actually cause cancer. Yep, this is what happens. Go ahead and have a look. Um, this actually repair genes. So um, they also follow the two hit hypothesis. You gotta lose both copies to um, get cancer. They repair DNA before DNA replication. We had eight of them. And so if we if they're damaged, um, the cells can replicate the best um, dysfunctional DNA. Yeah. So the majority of cancers have a mixture of mutations in both oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Yeah, pleasure. Did you guys do this workshop? No? No, cool, I'll skip it all. Okay, um, hematology. Do you guys like hematology? Really? Okay, cool. Yes? Is that is that sarcasm? <laughs> okay, um so um cool. So Okay, cool guys. Um so hematopoietic stem cells are tightly regulated. And so um hematopoiesis actually requires a number of factors to be successful. So you need the um actual stem cells, you need a suitable environment for the stem cells to stay in. Um that actually nurtures the cells and prevents the cells from apoptosis from uh, being destroyed and being overexpressed. And so um, what happens is your hematopoietic stem cells are usually in your bone marrow. And so um, the niche, so the environment in your bone marrow composes of reason chymal cells, stromal cells, connective tissue, osteoblasts, nutrient supplying blood vessels uh, that, you know, they're kind of like, they grow factors, they kind of fertilize, they cause the hematopoietic stem cells to undergo hematopoiesis. Uh, it's really important because um, people who have a deficiency in hematopoietic stem cells, um, they, yeah, they have problems. And so originally, um, you would do uh, donors would donate the hematopoietic stem cells and to give it to patients with blood disorders, but now growth factors are on this instead. Um, so, yeah, so blood cells, leukocytes, and a white blood cell, they can be divided into granulocytes, which include neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Or lymphocytes. So leukocytes, two two groups, granulocytes and lymphocytes. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, stem cells. Do you guys learn about stem cells? Cool. Yeah. So Tony Protein, uh, like um, the cells in the you know in embryology you have that eight cell stage. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called. Is it called the morula or like morula? Morula. Um. Yeah, so like, um, yeah, so that's the eight cell stages when all the cells are totally potent, so they can develop into any kind of cell. Um, guys, yeah. Um, pluripotent is um, when the cell can differentiate into all cells of the three germ layers, so that's your endoderm, your ectoderm, and your mesoderm. Um, multipotent is your hematopoietic stem cell, so that means um, you can become any cell of the host family, so that's your hematopoietic stem cell, you can become red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Unipotent means that this stem cell can only become one type of cell, it's kind of sad. Um, stem cell, sorry. Yeah, so like, yeah, embryonic stem cells you can get from embryoblasts. Adult, cell, adult stem cells you can get from virtually all adult tissues. But they're not particularly useful most of the time. Uh, yeah, you can get stem cells from the placenta and, um, uh, and umbilical, the umbilical cord. And they contain hematopoietic stem cells which can be used. Um, I won't talk too much about this. I assume like Abraham or something said we talked about it. Yeah, Abraham, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, induced, did you guys learn about induced pluripotent stem cells? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so what happens is like, sorry, did I just go through a little stuff that you guys didn't come up? No, okay, <laughs> um, okay so like, um, so what happens is adults, uh, adult somatic cells can be reprogrammed to become uh, stem cells, and they only need four reprogramming genes. And so genes, so you insert those genes, and it allows the cell to like um, un become undifferentiated. Um, and the biggest advantage of that is you can like turn your own somatic cells into um, 
introduce themselves so that you can use for yourself and your immune system your immune system won't attack it, so that's a biggest advantage rather than getting the stem cell of someone else. Um, but this technology is pretty new still, and so these these um, yeah these IPSs can can contribute to cancer. So yeah, this is like some of the genes that are reprogrammed or reprogramming factors. Hematopoiesis, um, competition of blood. Did you guys, did you guys learn about this? Yes, cool. Okay, so centrifuge separates your blood. You've probably all seen this thing before. Um, hematocrit is your erythrocytes, so your red blood cells, and they pull at the bottom. There's 45 in the male, or 45 percent of the blood. Platelets and leukocytes. Um, yeah, platelets and leukocytes are in the middle, and they're one percent of the blood. And plasma is on top, and so the rest of the 55 percent. Blood cells are constantly being replenished through proliferation and differentiation of hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, stem cell hierarchy. I was told by Gavin that you guys didn't do this. Is that right? <laughs> we didn't do this? <laughs> um, yeah, so like, did you guys do this or not? Yes? <laughs> yes? Uh, <laughs> Cool, yeah, so yeah, um yeah, so hematopoietic stem cells can divide and they can form a myeloid or a lymphoid precursor. So myeloid precursors are uh differentiate to become your red blood cells, platelets, or your granulocytes, um, whereas lymphoid precursors become your B cells and your T cells. Um, so, yeah, so it's a common myeloid uh, professor, a common lymphoid professor. Yeah, I just talked about that. Cool. Right. Did you guys learn this? Yes or no? Did you learn this? Yes? Okay, so, so this is how red blood cells are formed. Guys, are you going to listen or not? Okay, um, I know, I know it's getting close to lunchtime, I'll try and speak through this, I'm sorry, this is so much fun. Um, yeah, so this is how erythrocytes are formed, so from this hematopoietic stem cell, it'll become a pro-erythroblast, a mesophilic erythroblast, polychromatic erythroblast, and then in the orthochromatic erythroblast stage, um, it loses a nucleus, and so that's really important. So reticulocytes, which is the next stage, don't have a nucleus. Okay, so that's important. Um, red blood cells live for 120 days. Um, yeah, uh, 2.5 million meg per second. Production is modulated by the erythropoietin uh, protein (EPO), which is produced in your kidneys. Flow. Did you guys do flow cytometry? Cool. I'll skip it all. Did you do this? No. Did you do this? Did we? <laughs> Did we gather? <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so um, there are two different types of um, stem cells. So this stem Guys, can you please be quiet? I don't know, why are you so chatty today? I mean, I don't have to talk, I can just like go through the slides and you can read them. Is that okay? I don't know, I don't have to talk. Um, anyway, um, fixed number of stem cells. So, like, um, so there are some stem cells that will just like differentiate uh, into like various parts of the body, various cells in the body. Whereas there, there's a, a small group of blood cells at embryogenesis that are able to maintain itself. So, that's what a uh, hematopoietic stem cell. So, hematopoietic stem cells they, dif they can differentiate into other blood cells, but they also renew themselves, so they can make a copy of themselves, so that we don't lose them. So, we, so that for as long as we live, we can produce blood cells. Um, commitments may be stochastic, so it's just random. They just commit randomly to a niche, or it could be instructive. So if we have um, not enough white blood cells, um, something will signal to the hematopoietic stem cell to create that particular white blood cell. Yeah, so it involves where that. Control of, did you guys do this? Cool, skip. Did you do this? Let's go, colon insulin stimulating factors. So essentially, if you have this hematopoietic stem cell, you add different, you add different growth factors 
to make it into different types of cells. Okay, that's all you need to know. There's a lot of information here, but you, yeah, you don't really need to know that. It's just a certain type of like uh, CSF will create a certain type of cell. And um, so, yeah, and their colony stimulating factors are important when you have cancer. So when you have cancer and you undergo chemotherapy, it destroys all of the cells in your bone, bone marrow. And so you don't have enough metabolic stem cells. So what happens is when you administer the colony stimulating factors, it'll stimulate those remaining cells to produce blocks and blocks of blood cells to replenish blood flow. Um, yeah, also there's another way you can do it. So when you have cancer, they can collect your bone marrow. Um, you can they collect your uh, stem cells from your bone marrow, and they keep it in like a fridge. Well, not literally a fridge, but like liquid nitrogen. And then you undergo chemotherapy and destroys like half of your bone marrow. And then after chemotherapy, they what happens is the stored hematopoietic stem cell they'll inject it back into your body, and so that means you'll have more stem cells. Did you do a bone marrow transplant? I think I just. Yeah. I just talked about this actually. Yeah? Collect the stem cells, freeze them. Yeah, cool. Um, changes after birth. Did you guys do this? Yellow bone marrow, red bone marrow? No, cool. Biopsy of. I guess you didn't do this either. No. Thrombopoiesis. Did you guys thrombopoiesis? Okay. Make a carrioblast uh, type of stem cells and they have. Um, they're derived from your original hematopoietic stem cell. Megacaroblasts have receptors for thrombopoietin, and so when thrombopoietin attaches to uh, megacaroblasts, they stimulate the formation of uh, megacaroblasts. And so what happens is when the uh, thrombopoietin binds to megacaroblasts, um, um, it'll tell the megacaroblasts to uh, to replicate DNA lots of time without actually dividing the cell. And so this Forms this gigantic cell on the megacarrier side, which can grow up to 32 ends. Actually, it can probably grow up to more than that. So, the more ends, the more genetic information you have, and the more platelets you will form. And so, cytoplasmic infolding is the budding off of the, um, uh, the megacarrier side. So, um, when the cell buds off, um, so the little bit that budded off is called the platelet, and you have a uh, life of four days. Some sort of spleen and release as needed on the bleeding. Um, yeah, if you have, have do you guys line up on the first side of the video? No. Uh, yeah. Yes, okay. So, the first side of the video is when you don't have enough uh, platelets. And so, obviously, when you don't have enough platelets, we need to produce more. And so, more thrombopoietin is released and um, so that you can produce more mega carocytes and more platelets. Blood film, you guys know how to read this? To be honest, I don't know either. This is probably a phase of film, yes, I don't know. You should feel. I don't know what that is. Well, that's a lymphocyte, and I think that's a monocyte. But yeah, I don't think you'll be asked to read it in the exam. It's just, it was in the slides. Um, production of blood. Um, yeah, I think I already talked about this. Yeah, so what happens is, like, with the colony stimulating factors, they will attach to receptors on the hematopoietic stem cell. And so it'll un that means that the hematopoietic stem cell will undergo signal transduction and produce certain receptors and certain proteins within the cell. And so it'll make the cell uh, express certain receptors, which will bind more to the colony stimulating factor. And so that means this cell becomes progressively more specialized and more differentiated. So that's how differentiation occurs. Does that make sense? Yeah? So calling a stimulating factor stimulates this cell to produce more of a certain type of receptors, which respond more to this um, uh, colony stimulating factor, making this cell more differentiated. White blood cells, okay, we already talked about this. Oh, so lipopoiesis. Did you guys learn about lipopoiesis? No, cool, skip it. This is low yield. Thrombosis in homeostasis. So um, thrombosis is really important. It's, uh, okay, I have five minutes. So I'll go a little bit over guys, I'm sorry. Um, so the physiological process which um, your body uses to prevent bleeding, and um, so thrombosis is a formation of blood clots. So it means that you don't lose too much blood and blood things in your blood vessels. Um, yeah, so... And this is obviously really tightly regulated because if you have too much um, coagulation going on, too much thrombosis, it can cause like clots in the blood vessels and it can block off 
blood vessels and you don't get enough blood to your organs and so your organs can die, so it's function. Um, and so there's a really fine balance between coagulation factors and anticoagulation factors. So you don't have too much bleeding and you don't have too much thrombosis. Merkel's triad, do you guys learn this? Did you learn this or not? No? Yes? Okay. Okay, I'm just going to go through it because it's pretty important. So three, there are three reasons why um, your blood will clot. So if there's vascular injury, damage to the vessel wall, your blood will clot. If your blood stops flowing, it will clot. If there's hypercoagulability, which means there's too many coagulation factors or not enough anti anticoagulation factors can cause um, clotting. Uh, yeah, so vascular injury, atherosclerosis is a rupture of atherosclerosis, so it will damage the endothelium, so the bone vessel, and expose it to endo, um, the cell endothelium and um, causes platelets to form a clot. Vasculitis, again, inflammation of the bone vessel causes damage to the endothelium. Myocardium bunk, you can read that about, read about that in one time. Stasis, atrial fibrillation, so when your blood, your heart doesn't pump properly, your blood isn't flowing properly, so blood stays a bit more still than usual, so you can pull blood clots, venostasis, this is called deep vein thrombosis. When you've been sitting on a plane for too long and have a movement in your legs, the blood pulls in your legs, doesn't move too much, and so your blood can clot. If you um, if you compress a blood vessel, it stops the blood from flowing, and so, um, yeah, it can form blood clots. Hypercoagulability, um, that usually occurs when there's a lack of anticoagulants rather than there's too much coagulants. And so, um, yeah, so there are some of the examples. Okay, cool. Blood clotting and hemostasis. You guys definitely did this right. Yes. Cool. Um, so, if there's no breach in the blood vessels, so if the endothelium isn't broken, the blood is maintained in a fluid state by, because um, endothelium secretes anticoagulation factors. Um, but if the vessel is damaged, um, there are serious sort of events. So what happens is you'll get vascular spasm, which is um, vasoconstriction, makes sense because you don't want to lose too much blood. And also there's an exposure of some of endothelium, so your blood is suddenly exposed to the collagen and um, and stuff in the subendothelium, and which and this activates platelets and forms a platelet plug. And then once uh, the clot has formed and your endothelium recovers, um, your fat clot needs to be um, dissolved. So that's fibrinol fibrinolysis. And this includes um, this involves cellular components which are platelets or protein components which are coagulants or proteins. Um, Clot formation. So, yeah, I already talked about this. Endothelium secretes anticoagulating proteins from the modulin plus the cyclin. Subendothelium contains the collagen and von Willebrand factor, which enables platelets to bind. And so, the coagulation factor is not This is what happens in clot formation injury to the bone vessel, exposure to subendothelium. Platelets become very sticky, they attract other platelets. Um, yeah, they form a plug. Once the um, wound heals, the plug will be, uh, the clot will be uh, dissolved. Yeah, so adhesion and activation of platelets. So um, collagen and von Willebrand factors. So when, so when you have vascular injuries, when the blood vessel is broken, your blood is exposed to, sub to the subendothelium, which contains collagen and von Willebrand factors. What happens is um, uh, von Willebrand factor binds to the GPIB slash 9 receptor uh, and this like changes the shape of the um, of the platelet and when and this also activates the GP2B and GP3A receptor uh, which binds to the fibrinogen and also activation of um, these um, receptors, the GP1B and the GP2B, GP3A, um, will cause the platelets to um, degranulate, so it'll release proteins to attract more platelets and also cause further vasoconstriction. So some of the proteins that platelets that are activated, okay, so when platelets become activated, they release proteins such as ADP from what say, yeah, attract more platelets. Yeah, more vasoconstriction. And so when they attract more platelets, the, plug, the platelet plug will grow. Um, yeah, so coagulation factors, you guys learned about this as well. <coughs> factor 8, factor thrombin, yeah, cool. Um, 
Yeah, so coagulation factors are produced in the liver. Are produced in the liver and they circulate as um, zymogens, so they're proenzymes. And they actually need to be cleaved to become the active enzymes. Um, so the main aim is to form an insoluble fibrin clot. And so this is divided into three phases, but they actually occur at the same time. So initiation, amplification, and clot formation. So initiation is done by the tissue factor three. So, which is um, back to the so tissue factor is um, released from damaged tissue. So, we're, we're talking about an intrinsic pathway, an extrinsic pathway here. Okay? So, tissue factor will bind to um, factor seven, which activates factor seven, and then factor seven will activate factor nine and factor ten. And so, what happens is factor ten then binds with factor five. Yeah, so the activated factor five. So factor ten and factor five will um, activate thrombin from from thrombin. And so yeah, but, but remember this process also requires calcium. Yes, yeah? so if you have a lack of calcium, your blood can't clot properly. So factor ten and factor five, with the help of calcium, will form will turn prothrombin into thrombin. Yeah, so this is another diagram. Tissue factor factor seven. Activates factor 9, factor 10, factor 10 along with factor 5 and calcium creates from them. Um, amplification is um, so what happens is when you activate from them, so from them here, it provides a positive feedback network and it increases um, factor 10 and factor 5. And so when there's more factor 10 and factor 5, more from them will be produced. And so this is um, this generates a massive amount of pump, which is called useful like a from them first. Yeah, so there's some arrows. Oh yeah, these diagrams are not from two channels or from last year. Um, yeah, so like thrombin will make more um, factor five, make more factor ten, and make more factor nine and so on. Clot formation. So thrombin then converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and so this will form an insoluble clot. Thrombin also activates factor eight, which is involved in the uh, the intrinsic uh, intrinsic pathway that I haven't talked about. Um, and so thrombin forms um, covalent crosslinks between fibrin monomers, and so you get um, so the fibrin monomers become polymers, and so it will stabilize the fibrin mesh. And fibrin analysis will dissolve the clot once the healing of the interfering is complete. Yeah, so here we go. We have fibrinogen, which is one um, inactive molecule. Thrombin will activate fibrinogen to become like fibrin and some monomer, and then um, multiple fibrin monomers will form a fibrin clot with the help of factor A. Have you guys heard about hemophilia? Can we talk about hemophilia? No? Okay, yeah, hemophilia is a type of blood clotting disorder. Okay, lots of bleeding. Extrinsic versus intrinsic factor. So this is the intrinsic factor, which I didn't talk about, and this is the extrinsic factor. Have a look at this diagram. It's not particularly important. You just need to know that factor seven is in is involved in extrinsic. Factor 12, 11, 9 are intrinsic, and factor eight as well is intrinsic. Um, so regulation of clot size. So as well as as soon as thrombin is made, it needs to be regulated. You do not want un unnecessary uh, clotting because if you have unnecessary clotting, um, you'll form like a clot in the blood vessel and blood can't flow through, which is a problem. And so clot size is regulated by anticoagulants. Did you guys know about anticoagulants? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Like um. Anti-thrombin, thrombomodulin, protein C, protein S. Um, so they're all um, anticoagulants. So what happens is um, anti-thrombin um, inactivates factor 11, factor 9, uh, factor 10, and thrombin. And so this will, um, yeah, so it'll stop the blood from clotting. Um, yeah. And heparin is a medication. Do you have to learn about heparin and warfarin? Yes? Okay, so heparin, heparin will bind to will bind to antithrombin and activate it, and so it'll yeah it'll stop the coagulation factors from working. Um, yeah, so this is another diagram. So what happens is um, antithrombin will bind to heparin sulfate on the endothelial cells, and that will inactivate thrombin. So this is like we're talking about dissolution of the clot now, and thrombin. 
also can bind to thrombomodulin, which is uh, a receptor on endothelial cells, and this activates protein C. And protein C, when it's combined with protein S, uh, becomes the activated protein C. So that's what I mean by CA, so the activated protein C. And the activated protein C will inhibit further thrombin formation by inactivating factor A and factor Y. Yeah, so um, uh, the fibrin clot is um, made up of, yeah, so like red blood cells get trapped in the fibrin clot, which is why like um, when your blood clots on the surface of your skin, it looks red because there's blood red blood cells there. And it also contains platelets. Clot dissolution is done by plasminogen, which is another uh, enzyme produced in the liver. And so we use, and what happens is plasminogen needs to be activated, and it's, it's activated by this thing called calokine. Only when it's out activated will it dissolve the um, clot. And so plasma will cut the fibrin mesh into in various places, and um, yeah, so this is how we dissolve the clot. Yes? Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, did you guys, yeah, maybe I should like skip the rest of this. Did you guys learn about PT and ABCG? No. No. Yeah? No? Oh, okay, 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 okay. I, I get it, it's lunchtime. I get it, it's lunchtime, okay? So like, yeah. Um, read it in your own time. Um, but I'm towards the end of my presentation anyway. The rest of it isn't particularly important. But yeah, good luck for your exam and um, yeah, email me if you have problems.